Chapter 9 The Voices The Chronicles say then that they set course southward, and on the horizon before them rode the dark line of sails. But the great warships of the Ekwesh were far fleeter than the little cave boat, and before night on the first day the line had vanished. They are in the Southland waters now, muttered Cormorvan bleakly. They will sail on as fast as they may, through day and night, allowing no ship of ours time to spread the alarm. And so must we. But there are only two of us, protested Ills, who was taking the tiller as darkness came, when she could see better. And I am little used to this harsh sea sailing. We must beach her sometimes, if we are to rest. Kermorvan shook his head. Beach this cockle shell? We dare not. We might never be able to launch her again. It will be weary labor, but we must endure it. Teach me, said Elof. I cannot simply sit by and let you two exhaust yourselves. Kermorvan wagged his head doubtfully. You would not find this crazed little boat easy to learn on. Better a novice than nobody, insisted Elof. I can share your watches at first, and then take the helm on my own when you feel I am ready. So it was that Elof joined Ills on watch, and first learned the handlings of a boat. He must have been an apt pupil, for he could be trusted with the helm almost at once and was very soon left on his own. He took watches in the uncertain hours between light and darkness, for he seemed to see better than then than either of his companions. Like them, he would sit for long hours bowed over the tiller arm, not only watching, but listening, feeling, alert with all his senses for the changes in wind or water that constantly threatened to upset the unstable little craft, to split the light sail or snap the mast. Most of all, though, he had to learn to listen to the rush and slap of the ocean under the thin planks, and how they groaned and creaked in response, wary for the faintest sound of yielding joints or splitting timbers. It was an unnerving sound for it brought home to them all how fragile was the barrier between them and the envious sea. But the very lightness of the boat aids us, said Kermorvan, for feel how it flexes and twists. It moves with the water like a living thing, instead of against it. And so the force of the waves does not war against it. But that cannot last. Every twist loosens the seams a little more. We take in a few drops more water. If once a seam goes all together, we can do little to bail a craft this size. The number of our days at sea is already written, though we cannot read it. We dare not sail too far from the coast. And yet that in itself was a hazard as he explained to Elof, for there were immediate dangers in sailing too close in. Rocks, reefs, and hidden surfless shoals rose up too readily from deep water, and anything high up, cliffs, hillsides, even clumps of woodland, played mad games with the wind. Whatever landsmen might think, most sailors found it safer to stay well away from shore. For now they would have to strike a balance, and keep alert to the perils of the coast. In the end, though, it was out of the open sea that their greatest danger came to them, and it was heralded in Elof's watch, in the dark, moonless hour before the dawn. It was the twelfth day of their sail, and he was well used to his post by then. The wind, as it often did, had slackened at that hour. The air grew still and warm, 
and the sea as nearly calm as he had ever seen it. A slow, heavy, oily swell. It heaved and surged under the slow-moving hull with sluggish weight, and made little sound. But in the unaccustomed silence, Hilof heard another noise. It was faint at first, as if coming from a great distance, but it made the hair bristle on his head. At first he thought Ills must be having some evil dream, for it seemed a woman's voice, sobbing in desperate grief. But then, without break, it slid downward below the range of any human throat, deepening, becoming a low, dull, throbbing moan, as if the waves themselves groaned under the burden of the hull, under all the sorrows of the world. Another voice broke in above it, a high keening crooning, a high keening croon that sounded mad, or foolish, or utterly unhuman and another, a dark pulse, throbbing, humming, like the beat of some enormous heart. Elof listened a moment, holding his breath so as to hear more clearly. It seemed to him that the voices were getting louder, and there was something else in them. He slammed the tiller into its rack and vaulted down to the deck to shake Kermorvan's sleeping form. As always, the swordsman was awake at once. What threatens? Is it the hole? No, a sound. A strange sound, a frightening one. Like cries, high and deep, all together. It could be seals, shrugged Kermorvan. They grow large here in the south. Elof shook his head violently. I grew up by the sea. I have many times heard seals, sea lions, even the great morses and weed browsers. Listen, and tell me if this is like them. Kermorvan listened, and his eyes widened. Before he could say anything, Ills erupted out of the forecastle. Do you hear that? she hissed. The whole hull's a quiver with it. I hear, whispered Kermorvan, puzzled. Like nothing I have heard, unless... Ills, do they sound louder down below, under the water line? Why, aye, they do. Then they're coming up through the very sea itself? The sounds were growing louder, and it was as if there were more of them now. To Elof, wrapped with wonder and fear, they seemed to blend like some strange, unhuman choir, sounding strange harmonies that shifted and swirled like the shades of the north lights. And the feeling grew on him that there was indeed something more, that the eerie chords were forming other sounds, separate syllables of some vast, distorted voice, speech drawn out, elongated, smeared as ink is by a careless hand. A word, a single word, stretched out and repeated over and over with gigantic, timeless slowness. A word he could understand only too clearly. He gasped and clutched at Kermorvan's arm. Do you hear? I said I did. What ails you, man? Not only the cries. Do you not hear it? Hear the... the word in it? The word? Art Kermorvan, and listened again, frowning. No word, just... cries. Strange cries. No more. He turned, as if struck by a thought, and peered out over the shadowed water astern. No more, echoed Ills. Elof, what is it you hear? Elof heard his own voice sink to a harsh whisper. My name. 
Your name? Ill stood dumbfounded as a sound grew and swelled around them. The whole ship shook to a soft, booming growl, far deeper than any beast they knew of could ever produce. A high, crooning tone rattled loose metal fittings, and even seemed to shiver in their teeth. Suddenly, Kermorvan gave a great shout and pointed. In the swell astern, something sprang up, glistening and flicking in the air, and toppled back with a loud smack. Further off to seaward came other such sounds, a strange turmoil in the calm water. Another sprang up, close enough to be seen as a great barb-finned fish, little smaller in the body than a man. But even as it smacked back into the waves, something rose up that dwarfed it utterly. A great, dark hummock, lumpy and gray-mottled, edged with white foam. Forward it plunged, vanishing into the slope of the next leaden wave, only to burst out of its nearer flank in a great scatter of spray. Hounds of Nyarad! shouted Kermorvan, bounding over the mast and seizing a sweep from the rack beneath it. Another high hummock came arching up to no more than twenty yards to starboard. He stood poised with the great oar across his shoulders, straddling the center of the little craft, ready to leap to one or other flank. You two, to the tiller! Hold your course till I call. Be ready to go about at once. Ills and Elof reached the tiller, but as they seized it, spray flicked up a little way astern, and one of the fish leaped in the air, higher than their stern tree. But it did not land. From the wave beneath, with almost leisurely grace, a vast head arose, foam streaked, to intercept the heavy fish as it fell. Long spearhead jaws slid smoothly open, closed. The fish vanished without struggle or snap, and the mottled body plunged down in a great, solid cascade that seemed to go on and on. A flattened half-moon blade of tail thrashed at the surface and vanished. The brute's twice as long as us, whispered Ills. Or more. And look! She peered out into the first gray glimmer of dawn, too dim as yet for Elof to see that to see far. There must be hundreds of them, all spread out across the sea. Kermorvan, what are these things? He hesitated a moment. Valfis is what Elof's folk call them, I think. Whales? breathed Elof, staring into the gloom. Then he laughed. But whales aren't dangerous, unless you actually hunt them or sail across their path. Every fisher lad in my village knew that. Then they didn't know Nyrad's pack. These are not the great wise whales, nor orcas even. Look at the head on them. Narrow and sharp like the tip of an arrow. These are ancient, deadly brutes, with wit enough for anger and malice, little else. They are his sentinels, and his hunters. And may he draw them from us now. They called my name, whispered Elof. There was a sound like an explosion. Acrid spray fountained all over them, and great gaping jaws, wide enough to take in a man, breached only feet from the aft gunwale. The teeth were few and wide-spaced, but huge, and many crowned as mountains of stained ice, glinting cold as the eyes above them. 
set larger and higher than any common whales. Behind them rose the body, and the mottled grayness of it was not skin, but scaly armor. Great, heavy rows of shield-shaped scuts stuck in the leathery skin. It was like some vast serpent in armor, as large around as the boat and nearly three times its length. It lay there a moment, not hunting like its fellows, but rolling lazily in the swell. It twisted half on its side, exposing a naked white underbelly and long white fins, and its wide, cold eye glared up at the watchers on the deck. Then it rolled again, and from nostrils halfway up its snout, it blew great blasts of misty vapor, acrid and stinking, and ducked its head beneath the surface, slipping sideways. It's going under the hull, gasped Dills. Kermorvan nodded jerkily, but did not move from his spot. Do nothing. We may not anger it. It is far too powerful. The boat rose on the swell. The sea hill of the back slid beneath, and for a moment, Elof thought it would pass without harm. Then the little boat juddered, vibrated, groaned, and splintering sounds echoed up out of the open hold and forecastle. The vessel bounced along the immense back like a child's toy dragged over cobbles. The tiller leaped out of the rack and swung wildly. The sail spilled its air and thumped tight again. The improvised leeboard groaned in protest as it was scraped. The brute's scratching its foul hide, groaned Ills, running to the port side. Is that all it wants with us? I wonder, muttered Elof, grabbing the swinging tiller. But the others did not hear him, for at that moment came a violent, cracking buffet to starboard, and the whole length of the creature seemed to come surging out of the sea. It scraped upward against the hull, rolling it till the rail dipped into the frothing water. Quickly, lightly, Morvan rested the butt end of the oar against the scuts and fended the boat off as gently as he could. It may not notice, he began, and then the tail flicked up and the boat bucked violently, flinging him sprawling on the sea-washed deck. A loud snap echoed hollowly out of the hold, and the rush and churn of water grew suddenly louder. For a moment, it seemed as if the beast had dived back into the swirling sea. But then Ills cried out. A great turmoil grew in the water, and it breached once more. Its whole forepart arrowing upward, curving over as if to come crashing down upon the deck, staving the side in, if not splintering the little boat altogether. Elof staggered down the soaking planks, tugging the black sword free from his belt, and it whined an angry song as it matched edges with the rising wind. Did you call me brute? Did you not sing my name? I come then. Elof is here. In the moment of its falling, the huge body convulsed, twisted aside, and toppled awkwardly down into the water. It landed with a thunderclap, a massive fountaining of water that fell in sleeting walls across the deck. The wave caught all three of them, flung them up, and dropped them sickeningly. Elof went sprawling against the rail, barely keeping hold of his sword. The boat lay wallowing in the trough of the wave, floating at a crazy angle. 
Kermorvan hauled himself up by the mast. We're shipping water. Steer for the shore. Slithering and sliding, grabbing on where he could, he made his way astern to where Ills was fighting with the tiller. Together they threw their weight on it. He kicked out at one winch, and the yardarm creaked about as the sea beneath them steadied. Dawn glimmered in the soaked rigging, spilled highlights across the swimming deck. The freshening breeze tugged at the soaking sail and rattled the topsail as Ills raised it. Out to sea, surging and sporting after the fish that leaped now like jewels in the sunlight, the leviathan surged on and paid the listing craft no heed as it came rattling and creaking about in a last desperate race for the shore. Looking around, Elop was startled at how close to the land they were. It loomed over them, dark and featureless as yet against the glowing sky. The clash with the sea beast had somehow driven them far further in than they had been, and already he could hear the distant rumble of breakers. But louder yet was the hollow booming of the water washing around beneath the deck, and he turned and ran across the healing deck towards the forecastle. All their gear was stored there, and most important of all, the gauntlet. Water could not hurt it, but might easily hide it. Fortunately, the sea had barely reached there yet, though he could hear it thudding against the bulkhead to the hold as he hastily made up their packs, bundling up as much of their remaining food as he could. He resisted the temptation to put on the gauntlet, he could do many things with it, but not swim. Instead, he strapped it tight inside his jerkin and scrambled back up on deck, hoisting the baggage with him. It was already grown worse there, in the brief time he had been below. The little craft was still held on a broad reach, angling in towards the shore. But she rode low in the wave crests now, and at every dip, a little spray of water leaped from the hold. "'Good work, my friend,' shouted Kermorvan, as he made fast the packs to the sweeping rack, to the sweep rack. "'Now get you forward, and spy us out somewhere to land. We must needs bear away shoreward any minute.' Elof needed no urging. He was already at the stem post squinting out into the half-light to the jagged shadow of the land. There was something, it seemed. A beach, he yelled. Where away? Straight in, but where breakers? There are shoals around it. No help for that, called Kermorvan. Even now she splits. We bear away. For one sickening moment, as the bow bounced and plunged into the waves, Elof thought they would capsize. The shoals hissed and thundered on either side as he stumbled aft. They lurched a moment, almost checked as something tore shrieking in the bows. Then the next wave lifted them over and passed it, and they were running before the wind, running through water that became rougher, choppier, full of foamy streaks and floating masses of weed, towards a narrow spit of shingle standing out from the foot of a dark, high slope. There was a sudden smash. The boat lurched as the leeboard ground into some soft obstruction. Cut it loose! shouted Kermorvan, and Elof's sword crashed down through rail and planks and lashing. Once twice, and it was torn free and bobbing in their wake. Then a monster growled and seized the boat in its jaws, tipped up the bow, and crushed it splintering inward. The rigging sang a discord and snapped. Sail and yard crumpled downward, and the mast broke in its step and toppled across the deck. They were all hurled flat on the planking. 
After that moment of shock and stunning confusion, what followed seemed like sudden, reverberating silence. It was only as Elof lifted his head cautiously that he began to make out sounds again, and sensation. The sounds were ominous. The wash and rumble of surf upon stone. The sea flogging a hull, no longer light and resonant, but dull, congested, full. And the sensation under him was no more of riding the waves, but of being ridden by them, rocking and rising only a little, and constantly slipping, falling away. He tried to scramble up, and found the deck tilted to starboard at an impossible angle, and fixed there. He could see waves washing under the rail, looking strangely steady. We're aground, he said. We are beached, is what you would say. Kermorvan, leading from a scraped brow, was handing himself along the port rail above. At least the bows are, and split open like a rotten fruit. There is water enough here for the stern to sink, though, and perhaps pull us off. Better we get ashore at once. Elof nodded and picked himself up more carefully. The stern dipped alarmingly as he stood and barely rose again. Ills, less evilly overbalanced, stood braced on sturdy legs at the sweep rack, untying the packs. They grabbed them and stumbled forward, clutching at rails, cleats, or any likely handhold. One sprung plank came loose in Ilse's hand, and she seemed about to go slithering down into the water, but Elof was fast enough to catch her. The bows were resting on a shingle bank some twenty feet from the beach, and they had to scramble down the splintered planks and half wade, half swim to the stony beach, holding their gear clear of the water. They stumbled up above the wave line and collapsed onto the rounded pebbles, gasping with effort. Feeling the land they had not touched for two weeks seemed to heave beneath them, so used were their bodies now to the movement of the boat. After a while, Kermorvan rolled over and sat up, gazing at the wreck of the boat. As he watched, the waves took it at last dragging it from its weak hold upon the bank. Away it slid, its ruined bows rising upward a moment before they dipped and disappeared. It let us down, he said bitterly. All this way it bore us, and then failed at the last. We must still be far from Kerberhain. If it could only have lasted another day, another two. You yourself said it was never meant for such a voyage, said Elof. Call it rather a miracle that it lasted as long as it did, and sailed as well. Though your skill and Ilse's played an equal part in that, I am sure. A miracle? said Ilse. Not so. Not altogether. The boats of the Duergar are loyal. There are great virtues set in them. Of fair voyaging and safe landing. It did what it could. Yes, said Elof. It would have sailed on happily enough, I doubt not, had we not been driven ashore. De driven? Deliberately? Elof nodded somberly. There was a will behind those creatures. They herded us as they were herding their prey into the shallows. How are you so sure of that? Because you thought one called your name? Not one, said Elof. Altogether, as if the cries of the whole pack merged into one greater voice. I can say no more. Do we know where we are? I hope so, said Grimorvan unhappily. 
I had time to make out something of the land. If we are on the southern side of these hills behind us, there is yet hope. If not... But we will have to climb them to be sure. Aye, said Ills sourly, but not before we've dried ourselves out. And breakfasted, said Elof, rummaging in his sack. So much I learned from a friend called Rock. The worst world may look better from the other side of a meal. Hope or despair mean little to the starving dead. Hope may sustain a man, but better yet is bread. They built a fire of driftwood against a boulder, though Kermorvan was worried about the smoke being noticed. But Elof put on his gauntlet and drew out the force of its rising, so that it rolled sluggishly away down the stones and over the water, like morning mist. Food and fire did indeed hearten them all, and so when they were rested, and their boots no longer squelched as they walked, they set out to climb the slope that led up from the beach. It was a long road, for there was no path. The grass and undergrowth grew lush around their feet, and the sun was very hot. Small birds, blue as sapphires, whirled and screeched impudence among the blades and bushes. The trees were tall, but widely scattered, giving little shade. Many more were old stumps half hidden in the long grass, which hissed at the travelers in the hot breeze. They could take off their cloaks and jerkins, but not the burdens of their packs. So, this is the Southlands, panted Elof. A wonder any man can live here. I... No wonder they've got themselves red hair, said Ills thickly, shading her eyes. Mine's like to catch flame any minute. You should go further south yet, said Kermorvan, with a grim smile. For there the brilliance of the sun turns a soil hard and brown and parched, and yellows the grass even as it grows. And beyond that there are terrible... "'scorched deserts of stone and sand. "'A barrier no man may pass, it is said. "'Sure it is that many have died "'trying to reach the far south. "'Bracehal the lesser.' "'Strange,' said Elof. "'Could they not simply sail there?' "'Kermorvan shook his head.' At sea they call that region Nyrad's Oven. The wind will drive ships there, only to vanish and leave them hanging becalmed, while their water runs out and their crews die terribly of thirst. None care now to risk that. Elof shuddered. I cannot blame them. But who is this Nyrad they name so often? Do you not know? exclaimed Kermorvan. But of course you would not. Well. He paused and looked back at the waves washing far below. He is a power, a great power by sea. You might perhaps call him a cousin of your friend the raven. Ills shook her head decisively we hold otherwise, that they are of very different kinds and orders, those two. For one thing, Nyarad is said to be much more ancient than Raven, being more akin to the wilder powers like Tapayo. But another, Raven is a wanderer, but Nyarad's realm is the sea alone. It is said he is the sea for he dwells always within it, and seldom takes any more bodily form, having little favor for any life beyond its bounds. Yet it is told that he appeared in man's form at the founding of our great cities, said Kermorvan sharply, 
and he is revered among us by many statues in that shape, and no other. Bill shrugged. Perhaps he did. Who can be sure with the powers? Their nature is not yours or ours. Their purpose is seldom clear. Happy those who can avoid getting entangled in them. But that does not seem to be my fate, said Elof. And through the remainder of the climb, he thought long and hard about that voice and the name only he had heard. But when at last they came to the summit, he forgot it in an instant. At first concern drove it from his mind. Kermorvan had been looking around anxiously with a look of dawning recognition on his face. And abruptly he ran forward, his long hunter's stride carrying him up the hill well ahead of the others. And when he reached the crest and looked out into the distance beyond, they saw him clench his fists and raise them to the skies and shout something in a terrible voice. Startled and alarmed, they struggled and panted up the steep, grassy slope to join him. He turned to face them as Elof crested the rise. Damn that sea beast and all its kind of death and the ice eternal! We're still north of the hills! He turned and stopped dead. And look, by the gates of Karis, look! But Elof hardly heard him, for from here he could see beyond the, these grassy hills, and immediately he was lost in wonder at the lands that were spread out before him. The Northlands had their richness also, and he had seen much of them in his roamings. But the North, even at its green best, still looked wild. The land beyond the hills was something he had never seen before. A country shaped in its wholeness by man. It was a land of little rivers, each a sparkling silver thread running through its own broad plain between low, long hillsides. The plains were a patchwork of fields, green and brown and yellow, the hill slopes strung with terraced gardens and vineyards, or little clumps of well-tended woodland. Here and there in the nearer valleys, he could almost make out groups of buildings that might be large estates or very small villages, never anything much larger. It looked intensely inhabited, that land, he felt it ought somehow to be quivering with the activity of the thousands of careful hands it must have taken to make and keep it that way. It was a vision of mastery, of prosperity, of a people who had turned all there that lives and grows to serve them. Even the grass he stood among on this uncared-for hill seemed more regular, more even than it would be in the north. Nowhere did he see a trace of raw nature untamed, till he at last tore his eyes away from the amazing vista, to look down the steep slopes below into the deep dale that opened at his feet. All along this lay a long arm of forest, like a dark mantle. Of all he saw, it alone looked stern, wild, unmastered, a tangle of warring growth. It was taller than any woodlands of the cold northern realms, though it had no great majesty. But as the dale neared the southern coast, it diminished and grew shallower, and there at the last, within sight of the sea, the dark wall of the trees dwindled also and stretched no further. It is fair, this south land of yours said Elof softly, and Ills, standing beside him, nodded agreement. Fair, I, a noble stem. But how fares the flower? Kermorvan's clear voice trembled. 
He took Elof by the shoulders and twisted him round to look towards the southern coast. See there. Look upon Kerbrahain in Brahain. Kerbrahain, the city, the fair. His voice fell almost to a whisper in the wind. And look well, for you may never see more. We are come too late. And Elof looked, in deep wonder and delight, upon the mightiest work of man that he had ever seen. At this distance, brilliant in the hazy light, it might have been some minute toy or trinket he had shaped on his smallest anvil, carved out in his finest vice, some delicate brooch of polished gray-green rings, inlaid with fine flecks of ivory, and topped at its rising heart with bronze and gold, tipped with silver at the water's edge. But now the silver seemed tarnished, and there was a darkness in the air, a somber reek that hung over the lands around like the smoke of many great fires. Battle is joined, whispered Kermorvan, almost voiceless with anguish. And I not with them. Bear up, said Ill sympathetically. We'll get there soon enough. Soon enough, cried Kermorvan in a frenzy. If that boat had lasted, we would have been there in only a day or two more. Now we have a week's march, or worse. Surely not, exclaimed Ills. It cannot be more than twelve leagues distant, this great burg of yours, and over such fat, easy country for the most part. Cannot such hard doers as we traverse that in three days? Of course, said Elof. The coast curves out. We would have had to sail a long way around. But by land we need not follow it. We can go straight as the arrow flies. Once through that forest, what else? We cannot go through that forest, said Kermorvan in black anger, and sat down heavily in the grass. We dare not. Elof stared down at his friend. What's this? Dare not? The man who cut down half an Equesh war crew single-handed? Who took on a whole pack of snow trolls and tried to elbow a hunting whale aside? I and was ready to face down a dragon, chimed in Ills, frightened of a few moldy trees, even to save his city. Kermorvan's mouth twisted in disgust. I am not afraid, as you mean it, save of failure. Would you leap down a precipice to save going around it? Those are no ordinary trees. What you see below you there stretches back unbroken to the end of your mountain's hills, and through the lands there, out to the east. Ills sucked in her breath. Part of the great forest, then. I had heard it ran still almost to the sea, but I did not know it was here. I, the forest... Tapiola on Aethan, the black heart of the whole land, and we would be doing scant service to any of our homelands, north, south, or underground, if we vanished never to appear again. Vanished? said Elof. Indeed, and without a trace. So do all who stray over the fences of that shadowy realm. Do they not keep the tales of the tree realm, even in the north? Some, said Elof, but surely here. Kermorvan shook his head. Once it was much larger, spreading some way down all the valleys you see southward and those margins of it were less shadowed than the rest. In the days of our strength, 
when we had suffered too much loss from that forest. My people rose against it as they would against an invader or oppressor, and cleared it back for many a league. But this glen we could never clear, and to this day we shun it, save for a few foolhardy ones, and they never trespass more than once. They are too frightened to adventure a second attempt? They never return from the first. Ills sniffed disdainfully. This is foolishness, my lads. The Duergar walk at need in the margins of the great forest itself. Oh, it has its perils in plenty, yes. What part of Tapiao's realm would not? But nothing so absolute, so final, that we could not venture it. Not even the children of Tapiao. I can tell you now, I'd sooner risk crossing this little valley than see my homeland fall to the man-eaters. So you think me fool and coward that I dare not? said Kermorvan bitterly. She rested a plump hand on his arm. I think those who vanished, Kermorvan, were not such men as you. Or you, Elof. If the whales knew your name, perhaps the trees will know it too. Kermorvan visibly gathered himself together. He sat for a moment, hugging his knees and glaring out at the dark fumes that rose around his home. He shivered for all the warmth of the sun. So you both would venture it for a land that is not your own? You know what my true concern is, said Elof, and he too looked out to sea as once he had in years that were past. But if I wait till your city is overwhelmed, it will fail anyway, and other Southerns than you have been my friends. For them, for you, for my quest, yes, I would risk it. Ills chuckled. That master of yours all but tipped Ansker and me into a crevasse like the others. That's one score to settle, besides all else with the ice he serves. Aye, I'll risk it. Kermorvan gave a calm smile, as one whose troubles have been suddenly settled, and he sprang lightly to his feet. Then I cannot honorably do any less. Come. A river runs before the forest fence. We shall eat and drink there, and spy out our best road through. Come along, what do you stay for? And he strode purposefully away down the slope. Ills grinned at Elof, but he found it hard to return her amusement. Fear and courage were things he must come face to face with soon enough, and he marveled at how little he had understood them. On the Equest ship, and often since he had seen Kermorvan do bold deeds, and thought him simply unafraid, as little aware of perils as Elof himself might be of forge burns in the heat of some great labor. Elof had admired that, but felt it was something unhuman, remote, nothing he could ever hope to imitate. But here, now, Kermorvan had shown his fear. He had balked at what was evidently the worst peril he knew, a fear he had learned from childhood. And still he was walking, quite calmly as it appeared, into the shadow of it. How had he achieved that? Perhaps by finding? No. By creating a greater fear than that of the forest, the fear of dishonor. Elof sighed. What greater fear could he find in himself than of confronting his old master, armed with the very fruit and prize of Elof's own worst deed? In turning it against him, the master smith, whatever ill he intended, would be doing no more than justice. What could he fear more than that? 
the dark peaks of the trees seemed to thrust up at them from below. The travelers came level with them long before they had reached the valley floor, marveling at their great height. The thickness of the roof of foliage they spread across the valley. You could almost walk over that, exclaimed Ills. It would hardly be less safe, said Kermorvan dryly. By then, though, it was yet early afternoon. The sun was dipping behind the steep valley walls, and an ancient gloom seemed to drape itself like a shadow veil around the forest. To the bare lower tree trunks it clung, muffling sound, baffling the sight. Only at the margins did the trees grow light green in the sunlight. The bulk of the forest reared behind them like a wall of darkness. But as they stopped to eat under the shade of the outmost trees, rows of leaning adders along the riverside, it appeared quiet and peaceful enough. And it cannot be very far through at this point, said Elof encouragingly, as they finished their scanty meal. He stooped to fill their leather water bottles from the river as it came tumbling down the slope beside them, clear and shallow to fall rumbling into its own deep-cut channel between the roots of tall firs like gateposts. Kermorvan, chewing an end of smoked meat, said nothing. A few miles at most, Elof added, and beyond that, an easy way through the hills, by the look of it. We should be out by nightfall. If our way is straight, said Kermorvan, and rose. Well, we have naught to gain by delay. Are we prepared? Very well, then. But, Karis, if it were not the only way. And turning, he plunged between the adders into the gloom of the forest as a diver into deep water. And to the others, only a little way behind, he was as swiftly swallowed up. Hastily they scrambled after him, and found the undergrowth tangling thick about them. Sword ferns, wood ferns, five-finger ferns, tall horsetails godly ringed red and brown and green, tangled bushes of huckleberry, clumps of irises, and many others they did not recognize. Low branches of hazel, maple, and mountain lilac swept at their faces, but Kermorvan only a few steps ahead, was gliding between them with the ease of great woodcraft, and by following him they found the clearer ways. Ills had the least trouble of all, being the shortest. But Elof, wiping pollen from streaming eyes, tugged at his sword, yearning to hack his way clear. He remembered, though, the woodcraft he had learned from Kermorvan and Forbore. No need to make his trail any easier to follow her, to follow, if followers there might be. He became acutely aware that the ground was sloping away beneath them, the walls of the dale turning steeply downward once more. When he looked back to the back, the forest edge was high above his head, the afternoon light shining through it as over a high wall, split into smoky beams among the tree trunks. There must be deep places in here where the sun never reaches, where no light ever shines. He spoke softly and shivered a little. Even the wind among the leaves seemed high overhead, and below here it was strangely still. Indeed there must, laughed Ills. And what would you do if you had not got one of the Duergar with you then? Huh? My eyes feel eased as they have not done since I was carried off by you squint-eyed men. In this fine shade I can see patterns on plant and stone that you cannot. I can see the small things as they stir among the leaves. The very fungi on the rotting wood glow with light for me to see by. Now say, have I not the better of you strong swordsmen? <laughs> you always had. Chucked Elof. Chuckled Elof. 
he was suddenly almost achingly glad she was here, with her sardonic good cheer and stone-like steadiness. In a rush of sudden affection, he reached out and hugged her. She drove a bunched fist into his diaphragm, not especially hard. Hands off, you smelly young human, at least till you've had a bathe in something better than seawater. He laughed, unoffended. They had been friends since their first day together in Ansker's Forge. He had always found it easy to like ills, to forget she was of a different, alien kind, one that held men in no great esteem, and that she was undoubtedly far older in years than he. Now, though, she had reminded him of that, in a roundabout half-joking way. He did not mind, but nor, then, did he stop to think she might have been reminding herself. Kermorvan's harsh whisper broke in on them. Cease, you two. Are you on a country stroll? They knew he was right, and fell silent. There were sounds in the forest they should be paying attention to. The hollow music of tumbling water, the rush of swaying branches the rustle of leaf mold and snap of twigs on the forest floor, the patter and scurry of small things among them, the cries of birds. It was in these, in their sudden change or cessation, that they may find their only warnings of trouble, if trouble there came. Elof listened then. As he listened, he became more and more aware of the size of the forest. The sounds of it seemed to stretch away into infinity, to drown any faint murmur from the world outside. A difficult patch of brush brought him breathless among a stand of redwood trunks. He leaned for a moment on a wide bowl, looked upward, and stood rigid with amazement. Up they soared over him, those ragged trunks, to an immense height, as if they were pillars supporting the sky. They were even taller, growing from this steep slope, than they had looked from the hillside. The smallest of them was as large as the largest in the northern forests he knew. They grew closer together. The thick branches bristled out from the upper trunks to link and mesh into a roof so thick that only a shifting dapple of light fell to the damp floor beneath, and in some places, less than that. Elof understood the tangle of growth he saw around him, plant climbing upon plant, all clustering like frantic children around the boles of the high trees, redwoods chiefly, but with firs and cypresses among them almost as tall. It was all a struggle towards the sun, a slow, fierce war of jostling growth whose intensity, once perceived, was almost alarming. It was like walking among statues in attitudes of battle and seeing blood flow. The forest seemed suddenly a less peaceful place, full of jealous, malign vitality, and he scurried on to keep up with the others feeling he understood Kermorvan a little better now. More time passed, another half hour perhaps, and they were still going downhill. The light overhead seemed dimmer and grayer, the trees, if anything, even taller and more overpowering. Hills glared into the dimness. How far down does this dale go? I can't even see the further slopes yet. Kermorvan nodded. We will not be through before nightfall, I fear. Elof. But Elof gestured him to silence, and they stood very still. The birds had fallen almost silent. The sound of rushing water was louder now, below them. But there was another very similar note above it, a new sound of rushing and pattering and splashing. Dermorvan looked up, and water dripped down upon his face. Rain, 
he said. Well, we have shelter of a kind down here. No one place better than another. As well to press on. So they donned their cloaks, pulled their hoods out to shield their faces, and walked on. The wind rocked the treetops and drove last autumn's skeletal leaves dancing across the forest floor. But the mighty branches above them scarcely stirred. The smell of the mold grew richer, stronger, heavier, almost stupefying. The ceiling of foliage did indeed stop the rain, but only to pass it on as slower, heavier drops or a haze of spray which worked its way in everywhere. They were soaked in minutes, and deaf to everything save the sharp, relentless pattering, a sound which lulled the mind and numbed it. Then it came upon them. Elof heard only a sudden wind rush, moaning like a great horn, and a creak of branches above him before something seemed to smash down on to his shoulders. He twisted, tried to reach a sword, and instead found himself grappling with a tall figure, clawing at smooth, bare skin, slick with rain. Then abruptly he was sprawling, winded on the ground, a weight on his back, and a hard rod or staff pinioning his arms and head, driving his gasping mouth down into the mold. Beside him he could hear Ills threshing and cursing. Frantically he heaved upward, caught a glimpse of Kermorvan still on his feet, sword drawn, standing off a ring of indistinct shapes. A blow rang on his scalp, and he sank down, stunned. Dimly he heard a rush, clanging, shouts, and a thud as something heavy toppled down on the ground. Then he was hauled roughly to his feet, and hurried, stumbling to one side, unseen arms pinioning his hands behind him. Through blurred eyes he made out ills, disheveled and furious-looking, but otherwise unharmed, similarly held in front of him. Don't struggle, she hissed. Deadly danger! Tapio's children! Only then did he notice clearly the strange figures who held her. They were not a comforting sight. They looked human, but they were unhumanly tall and slender, nearly twice Ilsa's height and very long-limbed, with skin the color of light honey. It showed, for they wore little, and looked to him more savage than the Ekwesh. That much he had time to notice before the furious struggle around Kermorvan spilled over. A body slammed against him. The grip on his arms broke, and he tumbled forward into the path of another running figure, who leaped over him without stopping and vanished into the bushes. Shouts rang out. A scream. He sprang up, swept the black sword from its scabbard with a cold whistle, and fell upon the figure's holy nils. They dropped their arms and danced back. One flung a javelin. He swung his sword at it, and it exploded in flinders. Then, quite suddenly, they were gone. There was no trampling in the thick undergrowth, not a sound of flight. It was as if earth and tree shadow had swallowed them up. Ills bounced to her feet and pointed. Elof spun round and saw Kermorvan, breathing hard, with a great splash of blood across his cloak and more along his blade. And at his feet, twisting, lay one of the strange creatures. Elof stepped closer and gaped with astonishment. Under its dusty harness of metal-studded leather, it was unmistakably a woman. What forest demons have we here? panted Kermorvan. He looked deeply troubled. The woman's long arm was deeply gashed, and a puddle of blood was soaking into the mold around the shattered fragments of what had been a vicious-looking hooked pike. He and Elof looked at each other in momentary helplessness. This was an enemy. 
but could they let her bleed to death in front of them? They themselves had only been held, not stabbed as they could have been. And she could be some surety for them. Suddenly, without a word spoken, Grimorvan was on his knees, pinching the wound shut with his wiry fingers, and Elof and Ills were rummaging in their packs for bandages and salves. This should be sewn up, growled Kermorvan, but we cannot take the time for that. A bandage is only a minute's work, and will bar the blood enough for now. Let us hope her friends have the skill. Elof, do you stop her twisting her arm, thus? Ills, do you keep a watch? What are these half-men, anyway? Elof took the long arm in his lap and barely managed not to drop it as he saw the hand. It was half again as long as his own, and weirdly unlike it. It was as if an ordinary hand had been taken and stretched, but without growing any thinner. The four main bones and the fingers beyond them were all far longer, and in repose they curled inwards like a hook meeting the palm. The thumb, by contrast, was a little larger than his own, and set more to the side of the hand. But the muscles and tendons stood out around it as they did around the fingers, with an impression of wiry strength. He imagined trying to do fine smithing with such a hand, and shook his head. No wonder they were so primitive. But something jarred within his mind and he looked again at the harness and wondered. It was not the crude breech clout he had first thought at her thighs, but a shaped strip of soft leather bound round her hips, with a broader belt of the same stuff. Not a bad garment, if all its wearer cared about was protection, not modesty, and there seemed to be patterns worked on the leather. There definitely were on the broad studded strips that ran from the belt to cover her breasts, restraining them and acting as light armor. Protection again, but no undue concealment. It looked like fighting gear for a scout or fast skirmisher, cut down to the absolute minimum. But she would still need boots. He looked down at her feet, felt cold. They were bare, and they were shaped as weirdly as the hand. But there, somehow, it looked even worse. What then of her face? It was hidden by a tangled mat of brownish hair. Hesitantly, he brushed it aside, and this time did jump. The eyes were a glitter of icy green, wide, wild, slanted like an animal's, the face around them drawn back in a taut, snarling lines, lips stretched transparent over grinding teeth. It looked so like an animal, he expected her to fly at him. But then he knew it for a grimace of terror on features that were essentially human as his own. He opened his hand reassuringly, drew it back, and saw her relax. Morvan finished his bandaging, reached up, and swiftly bound the bent arm to her body. That will stomp the wound opening again, for now. We had best be on our way now, and her with us. Is that wise? asked Ills dryly. Is taking hostages honorable? Kermorvan winced. It is necessary. Helping her has was right, but it has cost us the minutes we gained putting them to flight. Anyway, she is no hostage. I will not harm her. But they are not to know that. Come. Another windrush moaned among the trees, and a sudden spattering of rain fell about them. There was a loud rustle of leaves. Too late said Elof through clenched teeth, and he cursed himself. It was obvious now how the other creatures had vanished so quickly. 
He, of all of them, should have seen it. That hand had been ideally shaped for tree climbing, as he would shape his forge tools. Now they had come back, with others, moving with the wind so they would not be heard, and swung down from all sides. They stood now in a wide ring, alert and menacing. They had bows now, and more spears poised to hurl, and even Kermorvan made no attempt to move. Elof could see their faces clearly then, and they surprised him. Men and women both were much alike, long, fair faces, clean-lined and clear-skinned, with high cheekbones and square jaws. There was little expression in them, but anger flickered about their mouths. The woman staggered to her feet and stumbled over to them, clutching her bandaged arm. If that had been a man, growled Ills disgustedly, you'd just have left him. Of course, said Kermorvan absently, then looked slightly puzzled. Elof held up his hand impatiently. The woman had been saying something to the others, and it seemed to him that he almost understood it. He tensed as one man stepped forward. Spear poised a stab and looked at the three of them. He stood with his legs apart, shoulders bowed, but even so, he seemed far taller than any normal man, looming over them all. Then he said something, and his voice was deep, but soft and gusty. Elof cocked his head, and the man repeated it. Erika, Asha. He's asking us if we're Ekwesh, exclaimed Elof. Ills gave a snort of disgust, and Kermorvan a rare peal of laughter. No, not Ekwesh, barked Elof, hoping he would be understood as easily. Ekwesh, he clenched his fist and made a gesture of hurling something aside. Do you understand? Tapio's children, you called them Ills said Kermorvan softly. Didn't I hear Ansgar say you trade news with these folk? More than news, said Ills hotly. Those are Duergar bows and blades. Small comfort. But there is little contact. They're a strange folk. And the Duergar do not have the freedom of their realm. I have never before seen them myself. And I do not know their tongue. Indeed, I am surprised to find them here, for they dwell mostly deep within the forest to the east. The woodman stepped forward, spear still poised, and stooped down to peer at her. She is of the Duergar, the Lady Ills, said Elof, slowly and clearly. The woodman turned to Kermorvan who stood very straight with folded arms. I am a warrior of the Southlands, he said calmly, by name Kermorvan. The woodsman stiffened slightly, but made no hostile move. Momentarily, a strange, remote look shaded his eyes. And I am from the north, said Elof, pointing uphill. A smith, called Elof. He tapped his chest because the woodsman had looked at him so blankly. Elof. Abruptly, the woodman grounded his spear and called out an order. Bows were lowered, but the wood folk swarmed forward. So quickly, the travelers were caught off guard. Before they knew what was happening, they were again pinioned in huge hands. Strong enough, as Elof now knew to sustain a heavy body swinging through branches. He felt his feet leave the ground, legs dangling, and then the forest seemed to rush at him as a wood folk charged into the trees. He flinched, but nothing struck him, though he seemed surrounded by rushing walls of green. He could not tell who carried him, whether the others were with him, 
whether he was on the ground still or up among the branches. The mad whirl seemed to last minutes only, but when his sight steadied, he was moving through a totally different part of the forest. Around him was deep gloom, and when he looked up, there was nothing more. No trace of sky or light of any kind. Somewhere beyond his sight, water ran hollow and deep. A sound of wind and branches seemed a distant thing, high up and far off. Over his head, the branches scarcely stirred, as if the wind from the world outside could hardly reach them. He could have been lost in the deepest delvings of the Duergar, and the few immense bowls that were gradually becoming visible in the gloom, only some carved pillars, stout enough to be a uh, mountain's roots. Hills, he called. Kermorvan? Here, cried voices some way off, and then they stopped. A hand shook him roughly, and he said no more. Ahead of him a glimmer of light was growing, and he saw that his captors were moving across a forest floor, now clear and almost bare of anything save leaf mold, fallen branches, and strange fungi. Small wonder at that, where no sunlight could reach. But ahead of it was a shaft of brightness, of dazzling brightness, a clearing in the deepest wood. Nothing grew in it higher than grass studded with small gold flowers, save at its heart a vast red trunk, alone and unsupported, glowing in the rich light of afternoon. Towards this he was rushed, half expecting to be tied to it. But instead, they stretched out his arms and rested his palms flat against the bark. Then, almost reverently, they set him down and stepped back. He half turned to look up at them, taking one hand away. One, a woman, reached out an arm that seemed too long, like a spider's, and pressed the hand back flat. Then she stepped away once more. Bewildered, he turned to face the tree. He smelt the faint aroma of the sun-warmed wood and found it pleasant. It felt much as any other redwood, fibrous, flaky bark on a heavily ridged bowl, softly rough to the touch. That, too, he found more pleasant than unusual, or more pleasant than usual. It felt positive, as it did touching an animal with a soft coat, one of his old cattle, perhaps, feeling the quickening of life beneath the skin, the play of muscle, the blood pulse in the veins. Here, somehow, he had seemed to feel the life of the tree, the moving sap, the sunny leaves, the drinking roots, the slow rhythm of unhurried, unhindered growth. It was a strange, a unique, exciting feeling, and he thought of a whole forest that pulsed with life like this, his mind racing from tree to tree, to shrub, stalk, fern, grass blade, seed, fungus, spore. And there too among them, darting like the very sparkles of the sunbeam, were patches of quicker, hotter vitality that enlivened the whole, spice that made a sweet dish more than bland, animal life among the plants. He felt his weariness, his shock, fade in the sun's warmth. The thirst in him melt away, almost as if he could put down roots to tap the earth. That struggle for existence he had noted now seemed more like a dance, a piece of music made of many themes in which each won itself a place, a time, and dared not outstay it without discord. It would fade when it was done, but grow again. He saw, in its totality, the interlinking, interwoven life of the forest, and the greater whole that its parts made up. A leaf trembled, a tree creaked, a hawk stooped, and scuttled. In a clearing, startled by nothing, 
a bright-eyed deer leaped and sprang away. A thought awoke, and he understood. Why have you come here? Why? He stared wildly around, but he knew he had not heard that voice in his ears. It was a vast sound, and cold like a great shout from afar. It had a strange, wild note in it, waxing and waning like the gusty wind, like the clear horns of the village hunters he remembered, blowing in the distance near dusk. My name is Elof. I know your name. Why do you trespass in my domain? I... I seek to reach the... The great city of the Southmen. The Ekwesh besiege it now. I have had tidings. What would you there, you and your friends? Elof looked nervously at the tree, staring up towards its lowest branches, high above. He noticed then that its summit was sharp, not rounded as so many tall trees were by strikes of lightning. Kermorvan had said that the forest was his people's foe. Did he dare risk telling it? This voice that seemed already to know so much? About his weapon? His quest? I and my companions, we bring help to them, that is all. Three against thousands, they will scarcely miss you. Elof pursed his lips against a bitter retort. Do you favor the Ekwesh, then? The light seemed to be fading, and looking up, Elof saw that the sun had sunk below the rim of the ring of trees. Gray clouds were drifting across the, sky, the circle of sky above. Far distant in the wood, a wolf howled, a sound of distant anguish and pain. I... I do not favor the Aika Iawasha, nor he who drives them on, Lohi's huntsman. Do you not know me? No, said Elof, angry at being toyed with, yet wondering even so if he spoke the truth. The wind rose, the trees shook and rustled, bending before it as if in obedience. I am Tapayao. Elof's fingers dug into the soft bark. I know no more of you than that name. Do you not? There was almost a note of amusement in the words. A great cloud of pigeons flew up, whirled around, settled among the branches once again. Know this, then, one alone, that I am a power among these trees that this is my domain, and I gave you no leave to tread within it. You should have chosen some other way south. We did, barked Elof, angry and shaken. We tried to go by sea, but were forced ashore by whales. Even so... Then Nyarad also will not have you within his domain. But I will be merciful. Go, take your companions, and retrace your steps. But this is vital, pleaded Elof desperately. We bear something of great import. If we do not reach the Southburg within a few days, we will be too late. Wind whipped at him. The leaves crackled. He looked up, around. 
gray cloud now blanketed the sky, and sunset was near. Drops pattered down among the leaves once more. No word was spoken, but Elah felt at once that wall of shadow he had first seen, an immense indifference. He beat his fist on the bark, but knew as he did so that it was useless. The voice was not in the tree. The voice was in the whole forest around him, stretching out to its remotest, unguessed-at distances. The tree was a focus only, a local one, like a window, a door. And now it was closed, barred, shuttered. The forest had turned away from him. He bowed his head, and his hand sank down on the tree. He was about to take them away when he heard a harsh cry from above, saw a flickering speck of black out of the corner of his eye. He looked up again. The sky shivered with light, and there was a distant crackle of thunder. There were two of them, tossing and swirling around the blasts of the upper air, riding the coming storm as if for sport. Down they came, circling, spiraling, calling carelessly to each other in tones he seemed almost to understand. Squawking and flapping, they burst in among the branches of the great tree, scattering a rain of dry, scaly needles and cones down upon Elof's unprotected head. And with a final, insolent caw, they settled on a low, thick branch that bent alarmingly under their weight. One cocked its head and regarded him with beady amusement. Duncan, it croaked. He heard the word clearly. Remembering, croaked the other. Delay, said the first, and ruffled his wings. Danger, said the second, and in high alarmed tones added, Help! It rattled its long black beak loudly and wiped it along the bark. Storm, said the first. Lie, croaked the second, and they took off in a thrashing flurry of wings. Thunder rumbled again, startlingly near, and again the sky was lit pale. Into the middle of it they vanished, dwindling to dark specks, and were no more seen. I could understand them, said Elof aloud, staring after them. Those who have tasted the blood of the worm may come to understand much in time. You again, gasped Elof. What now? I spoke in haste. You did not say enough of your errand. It is important, and I will not hinder you. But still, you may not walk freely in this land, nor linger a moment longer than you must. My folk will bear you to its southern borders faster than you could go yourself. Thank you, Lord of the Forest, breathed Elof. Do you call me that? I thank you, and for thanks be warned. The trees creaked softly. That you bear is not enough. More is needed. More, Lord? breathed Elof flooded suddenly with despair. I have no more to give. Not yet, but I would aid your quest somewhat. Hold still. There was a sharp, snapping crack, and something fell slithering down the great trunk to land with a crash beside him. He looked and saw that it was a small branch, a twig, really, 
but thickly covered in the scaly redwood needles. Take that and guard it well. While there are needles on it, even withered and dead, something of the virtue of forests will cling to it. It will not shield you in the brightness of day, nor in the clear moonlight, nor among the cold stoneworks of men, but among nature, in times of twilight and shadow, it will help you pass unseen. Elof stooped to take it and bowed his head. We will use it well, Lord, and acknowledge the power of your realm. But what else must I? It is nothing I can give. You will know it, I think, when most you need it. Now go. Again, Elof felt his arms seized, found himself whirled round, and saw the trees come rushing at him. The stormy air whistled around him, the branches swung and nodded wildly, and now the movement did not stop, but went on and on, a great giddy rush that left him breathless, barely able to think. Then it ended. The onrush dropped suddenly, sickeningly downwards. Then the grip on his arms was released. Foliage whirled around him, and he tumbled with a rustling crash into a drift of rotten leaves. He sat there a moment, winded, shaking his head in utter confusion. But still clasped in his hand was a long sprig of redwood. Elof! shouted Ells, and he picked himself up, dusting away damp fragments of decay. He saw his friends rushing through the trees towards him. Ills made it first, and caught him in a hug that strained his ribs. Where'd you get to, idiot? All we knew is that they whisked us off. We heard you shout, and then we were swung here. And dropped, said Kermorvan, flexing his arm gingerly. But they left us all our gear. I begin to think I was not so foolish, tending that witch woman. They are a strange people said Ills. Surely if they are stranger than the mountain folk, grunted Kermorvan, as they turned to the pile of gear and began to gather it up. At a hazard, Elof, you were taken to their chieftain? Say instead, their father, said Elof. What? Later, said Elof, unnerved. He turned to ease their redwood sprig carefully into a pocket of his pack and strap it on. Ask me later, if at all. We must leave here at once. Kermorvan shrugged. Easily done. We have come right across the dale and are almost at the southern fence of the trees. A pass opens between the hills only an hour or two's walk east of here. Ills shudder, shivered. But the weather... Can't we settle down for the night here in the shelter of the trees, then out there on the windy hills? The sound that stilled her was not loud, but it was very large, as if many trees and bushes rustled all at once. They turned and became aware of the shadow that moved slowly among the thicker green behind them. It looked like a moving wall behind the leaves. Hands crept a sword and axe as it lurched slowly closer, then fell away in dismay as they saw the true size of the thing. The bulky body rose to more than twice Kermorvan's height above the ground, on four legs that rivaled the redwood trunks around them in both girth and appearance, for the whole brute was covered in sparse but shaggy brown fur, thinnest on its small triangular ears. Small, red-rimmed eyes, glinting with a mildly wicked merriment, gleamed out from the bony, yellow-crowned, high-crowned skull. And below them, 
weirdest of all? Two vast curving blades of yellowish-white horn or tooth. Longer even than the very forelimbs of the beast, they crossed at the tips, and between them rose an immense, flexible snout that browsed and ruffled among the thick foliage. Mammut, whispered Ills. But a kind greater than any I have heard of, that's sure. It looked absurd, that snout, until they saw it pull down a huge branch with casual strength to shame the arm of a troll. Not far away among the trees came another, similar crash and rustle. Then the travelers backed away as one, very slowly. Would you still linger? hissed Elof. Tapiao bids us be gone. I know well enough when I've outstayed my welcome, Ills muttered. Yon hill takes on a strange allure. So they caught up the last of their gear, and wrapping their dark cloaks about them, they moved silently away among the trees, until they came at last out into the cloudy dusk. The hillside beyond was steep, the grass and bushes tangled, but they did not stay to rest, clambering up it as fast as they could go. A blaring call, trumpeting derision, sounded at their backs, but only Elof stopped and turned looking back across the dull sheen of the leaf roof to where it parted a little around the pinnacle of the tallest tree and touched for a moment the rough outline of the sprig within his pack. Then Nils called him, and he hurried on.